Okay, so due to my stupidity, I forgot to turn on the microphone. Now, well, okay, so we're gonna start on properties of integrals, right? So we have so many properties of them. And here's the proof. So for part A, I first consider, I have a lemma first. We have a supporting lemma. You can take a screenshot. And we first consider c is greater than zero. Then take a screenshot. Yeah. Yeah. And we consider when c is equal to zero. And also we again consider c is negative. And then we come and we turn the negative into problem with positive numbers involved, right? And yes, it has process. And part two is the sum of the integrable functions is integrable and the integral is the sum of the integral well yeah it sounds funny but <laughs> and you, you you just prove it just con consider just take a screenshot all right man it's so stupid arbitrary all right boom 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 this is c it's like, it's like if you have something between them, right? Then you have this proven. And for part D, part D is like the bounded, right? If F is bounded, then the integral is, is also <laughs> bounded. Use this and this. This is, this part is we used in female secret negative, supreme negative. And part E is we work with the the alpha one, the alpha function, the d alpha, right? The d alpha of x because we have, right? And that's the proof, just take a screenshot. And for this theorem, the product of the integral function has an integral and also if f has integral, then the absolute value it also has integral, and the absolute value of the original function is less than the integral of the absolute value function. And here's the proof. All right, and I'm gonna consider a step function, which looks like this. If this is equal to one, and Read it, screenshot it. So stupid, bro. So stupid. All right. Yes, yes. And this one is like if f of x is this ugly looking function, right? And f is continuous, then we have this. This is true. And also this, take a screenshot. Take a screenshot. Take a screenshot. Yes, you can understand it. I, my my writing is uh, more detailed than Rudin's. All right. If you can't even understand Rudin's, I mean, if you can understand Rudin's proof, then you can understand my proof. <laughs> Bro, and this is like really really long, right? If you read it, you're going to understand it, right? So. <clears throat> Alright. Lecture 21. 21 is the climax of chapter 6, which is we prove change of variable, and then we prove some properties, and then we prove the fundamental theorem of calculus, and then we prove the integration by parts formula. Okay. So, chain of variable. Read it. And here are some observations. Right? And here's the proof. So, we know that this is this. And for each P partition, we obtain a Q partition by taking the function. Right? So, this. And also, for any X in the interval, we have this. This maps to this. For the NY, well, we have this maps to this. 
and this shows that output of f on this and g on this are the same and also we have this formula if you take a look so they're equal to each other and also for l and also f has integral then we can do like we change p into q it also works so g has integral and now we want to prove the formula right so for any partition of big a to big b we obtain a partition for little a little b by taking function value by taking the phi v whatever and we have this inequality gets this and also we have this so this and this both both true and we're done and we're going to look at a special case when alpha x is equal to x read a textbook right this is more detailed easy it's not hard and this one is f x is the gets this then this function is continuous and if f is continuous at some point then it's differentiable at some point and the derivative is equal to exactly the point f naught i think this is the first fundamental theorem of calculus i believe i read it in like grade, grade 10 really i forgot but suppose f is bounded then we have this equals this this becomes this and less than equal to this because by by the bounded properties by the bounded properties take a look at this one right bound properties gives you this pick x y such as this this gives you this if f is uniform and continuous this shows that f is uniform and continuous which is continuous and also f is continuous if f is continuous then you have this and then you consider for s and t inside the delta interval first we say with f s in x naught and t is greater than this then we have oh the left hand no right hand limit is equal to this as a left fitness which means is which means, right and the fundamental theorem of calculus well I can memorize it so with epsilon greater than zero we have a partition such that the epsilon lower sum has the Riemann condition and we've applied mean value theorem which means that for any x i and for x i and x i minus one there is a t between them such that this over delta x i equals to this times the derivative for some t i and by definition is equal to this and then you multiply it it comes here so this sum is a telescoping series gives you this and they're they're epsilon close to each other because they're epsilon close to each other so each of them are inside them i don't know so this gives you this which is the fundamental theorem of calculus and for integration by parts you consider this and you take derivative and you're done and lecture 22 imagine the title lecture 20 lecture 20 lecture 22 <laughs> last chapter well we're given a sequence of functions and suppose for each x f and x converges right then f we see that it converges to some fx then this is a function you the input is x and the output is the limit of f and x is a limit function we see it converges pointwise and the main problem is that if each f and their continuous differential integrable does the limit function continuous differential integrable well so in case of continuous right if f is continuous x means this is true then this is f ft and does this equals this so in general we're swapping limits right this becomes this and this becomes here if, can we swap can we swap limits carelessly in general nah but further we'll prove that it holds under a certain condition and here are some examples from the textbook i'm not gonna go through it and uniform continuous so <clears throat> by the definition right read it similar to uniform continuous Point one continuous means that for any epsilon and for any x, 
there's an n, but this n might depend on epsilon and x, right? But uniform continue, uh, nah, uniform convergence means that for any epsilon, you have an n that works for every x, which is a really, really strong, way stronger than pointwise uh, convergence. <coughs> and we say that the series converges uniformly if the partial sum sequence converges uniformly. And we have the Cauchy condition. The Cauchy condition means that it covers uniformly if and only if any x and e. Bless you. We have this. Then we have this lemma. If the limit is this, then the limit of absolute value is absolute value of the limit. And the proof is by triangle inequality. So for this, this direction, easy. This direction, easy. Right. And for this, if it converges pointwise, and we have and we define this. So M N is is like M so this is the primitive of set of all differences for X and E. And we define M N to be become the supremum for this FN, right? So the pointwise becomes uniformly convergence if and only if. This is true. It's really, really simple. Just screenshot it. It's really, really fast. So, if f, if f uh, n is bounded, then the sum is covers uniformly if the sum of the upper bound, the series of upper bound converges. This is by the triangle inequality with large m n and we apply Theorem 7.8, right? By the we apply the Cauchy, Cauchy uh condition, oh no, Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence. And we're gonna discuss with the continuity. We're gonna discuss continuity, differentiability, and degradability. So we first uh, discuss continuity first. So, which means that we can swap limits if it is uniform convergence. Right, and we prove this first. You read it. Yes. If you can't even understand the question, you better drop this quiz. So, if you don't even understand what it's saying, then you should drop this quiz. So, you read the proof. Read it. Read it. So, this coverage is we let the limit equals to A. Then we have, here is the triangle inequality. We pick n such that if each of them is less than epsilon or 3. So they add up uh, uh, equal to epsilon. So this is less than epsilon. So choose n such that this is true, this is true. This is true is because uh, the convergence. This is also true because of the convergence. And also we have the, 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 we have this is true, right? Uh, we have we have this is true. So this is basically seeing this. And in general we have this. This one's a bit complicated. So the metric space is compact and each sequence is continuous and converges pointwise to a continuous function. And the function is uh decreasing then it implies uniformly convergence. Well, basically we let gn become this. They want to show that this uh, converges to zero uniformly on k. No. Well, that sounds to zero. We define this set. Read. Think about this set. Observe. Think. It, think about it. And stare at it for half an hour. Nah, three minutes. Nah, three seconds. And we know this is true. Because f is... So does g. Because the f will cancel out if you subtract it. And they're also nested. Think. Be be because this gets this. Look at this. Think. Also for x and k. Because this tends to zero, be which means that when n is large, we have g and x 
is going to be less than epsilon for large n, which means that x is not in kn for some n. For any x, it's not in some kn, which means that if you take all their intersection, it should be empty, right? And as gn continues, this is closed. This is closed means the inverse of my image is closed. And the inverse of my image is e, uh, precisely kn because gn is continuous. And it's a closed subset of a compact set, which is compact. This theorem is lecture nine, I believe. Lecture nine. Lecture 9, compact sets, lecture 8, lecture 8, lecture 8, oh, this one, so, so, what we have now is that first, they're nested. All their intersections are empty and each are compact. So for this one, we say collection of compact subsets. So if every finite sub collection is not empty, then that is not empty. If we consider, if we consider the contrapositive, is that if this is empty, then there exists a finite subcollection set of the intersection is empty, right? The contrapositive, which now means that there exists a finite collection such that the intersection is empty, which means that some kn is empty because they are nested. Well, this, if you translate it, it gives you this. And also for any n greater than n, because gn is like decreasing, right? This gives you this. Well, this precisely is the uniform convergence. A new metric space. So, let this be a set of all complex value continuous value function with a domain x. But when x is compact, the image is compact because f is continuous, and it is bounded, right? Because a heine borel theorem, this becomes this. We only require to be continuous because it's going to be, it's going to be bounded automatically. Just an extra. It's okay. Now we get to define a new metric. So you'll let this define this, read it, and we define the distance become this, and then verify it on your own that this with a metric D is a metric space. Verify it on your own. Or some answer you can read it. Okay. So theorem uh seven point nine, which is the Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence, means that it covers uniformly, if and only if. This is true. Well, because each f n x minus f x. Yeah, basically this. Right, uniform convergence means this. This means that this is equal to this, right? This is true. And this is means that fn converges to f with the metric d with c of x, which means that they are equivalent. This is an equivalent relation. And we're going to show that the metric space with the metric this is a complete metric space, which means that every Cauchy converges. So we let fn be Cauchy. Then, boom. Then, boom. Then, boom. Right? This is a Cauchy criterion for uniform convergence, which means that there exists some function, a complex value function, that they converges uniformly. And each if this is continuous, then f is continuous because this is uniform continuous. Why? Because we proved it already. And there is n such that 
So we showed that f is continuous and f is complex value. To show that f is n, to show that f is n, the function space, we only need to show that it's bounded. Now it is bounded because this triangle inequality, right, gives this for an x. So also, if it's n this, it's n the space. And as this uniform convergence, which means that this converges f with respect to the metric this. So this is complete. And we're done. Uh, ignore this, all right. Or I can read it and take a screenshot of it. Oh, whatever.